Is UConn gearing up for a monster recruiting class? Let's find out. You're locked on. You are locked on UConn, your daily podcast on the UConn Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On UConn your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Before we dive into today's show, we always ask you to take a quick moment to do us a small favor. If you're enjoying the content, please take a second to subscribe. Click that button on the YouTube Follow the audio versions, Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon, wherever you get your your podcasts. It really helps the show grow, and I truly appreciate all of the support. Every follow, subscription, download helps create more revenue for UConn NIL. So, yes, Locked On UConn is donating 10% of all revenue to Bleeding Blue for Good. So by supporting this show, you are directly supporting the UConn Athletic Program's efforts in the NIL world. Thank you for being a part of this community. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. So let's set the stage. Darius Adams has signed with UConn. In their UConn is in the top three with Braylon Mullins, along with North Carolina and Indiana. Our sources tell us that it's likely coming down to Indiana versus UConn. Top five with Eric Reby. Though some of the some in the mix are Oregon, Creighton, Indiana, and Kansas. I'm not hearing a lot about Oregon, although I know he's intrigued by it. Um, definitely hearing UConn is in a good place. A little bit of Kansas, but also uh, Indiana has been a big player in this recruiting class. They missed out on a few of their homegrown guys. Uh, I think they really love Eric Reby's. Uh, um, seven foot potential and the ability to stretch the floor. So they're going to be a top contender, but also Creighton is my dark horse on that. So that also could come down to Indiana versus UConn. Pretty wild to think. And then also in the top four with a Caden Lewis, there Caden is taking a visit. I believe already Gary took his visit to Kentucky and to Duke. Um, it's also North Carolina and UConn. So UConn, North Carolina, Duke, Kentucky for a Caden Lewis. I think that's a lean Kentucky. Uh, actually, I think it's a heavy lean to Kentucky. We'll see about that. Uh, top 10 with Malik Thomas. I know that he just recently just went to Arkansas. Uh, I know the crystal ball folks are, are now changing UConn to Arkansas with Malik Thomas. Makes sense. Lastly, he's UConn is rumored to be in the mix with Nate Ament, a top four or five-star recruit out of Virginia. Um, and I think it goes without saying. Um, we're going to talk about recruiting on the sh show today, but also we're going to bring in Evan Rodriguez of Store Central to talk a little bit of everything from UConn uh, basketball to UConn football. But before we get to Evan, I really wanted to dive into you know some comments that Dan Hurley made about building culture, and you know that leans right into where they're going with these recruits. So if you're like me, you read the tea leaves of what coaches say. It's not just what they say; it's how they say it. Um, Dan has been on on talk, talking about that he's selling these. I, the question that was asked of him in preseason media availability is, do you take pride in the fact that you're building essentially a pipeline? Or how close are you to building that kind of pipeline where you don't necessarily have to go into the portal every year? And that it's, it's, it's about, you know, the strategic vision that you guys all put together. And he said, he joked around and said, you must be talking to my therapist. He said, you know, I took a, take a ton of pride in that. And here's the thing. With UConn right now, he's not selling. He's selling wins. He's selling. He's selling championships that you can be a part of something special. Special, but that's the culture. He's selling the culture of UConn that it isn't a program that's looking for quick fixes or short-term games. Will they bring in one and duns like Steph Castle and potentially Liam McNeely? Of course, but as a greater part of their culture and if they fit the team's mold and it grows together and contends for championships every single year. He's letting these prospects know that UConn's approach isn't transactional. It's not about a quick 10-month stint and then on to the next. Hurley's building relationships, creating an environment where players can thrive over multiple seasons if that's their choice. And for recruits, that's, I feel like that's a huge change than from what they're hearing other places. At other places, it potentially could just be about you know how much money they could make, the opportunity, the brand. Um, they're not just being told that they're going to be here 
uh, in, in you know for ten months and then they're gone. But they're also told that they're going to come in and, and help us win games. That they're going to be able to grow in the process as people, as basketball players, and they're being shown that at UConn. And you can tell by the way, even the play, even the players' uh, parents have described UConn as being a place where their their kids feel like they can grow into men. Uh, and they can reach their full potential, whether that's preparing for the NBA or becoming a better leader on and off the court. That's all about what UConn and Dan Hurley and his staff are doing. This emerging pipeline, uh, as we just mentioned, with whether it could be Darius Adams in the fold, I, I, I would be led to believe that he is selling these recruits that, yes, we are bringing in a lot of players for competition, but you want to be playing with the best competition on your team so that you can go and kick the ass of everyone else around you. So that's got to be a, a good feeling. A lot of these players, this isn't like you know when I was growing up, where one or two players went to a school and they played against uh, you know two of their buddies who they played in AAU. Like all these guys have played together over the years. Like you know AAU programs that are nationwide and they and they play on these circuits. And to think that you wouldn't want to partner with players that you played with or that you know and that you're friends with on the collegiate level at a UConn is insane. And I, and I think that that's with, with, I think this is where this, this, this UConn recruiting is pivoting because now you can't, can't go in the portal as much because there's no COVID year. Um, you know, there's no like fifth year grad, grad transfer. You can plug and play like a, like a, um, a Cam Spencer. So it's, I, I know that coach likes to do this better. He hates the portal. So I think this is so conducive to what he's trying to do at UConn to build kind of this this type of appreciation of these players over time. And I think he also realizes that the fans appreciate that. Um, one of the things I love about the women's game is that you can actually, you know, learn about a player over two, three, four years because they stay with the program. Can they transfer? Yes, and that will happen too. Now that now that that that's these these transfers can happen all the time. But it's it's been the one difference uh, that you can you can point to the two games that the you know, not the one but one of the ones that I, I feel like the women do better on the men's side. I love to see them play quarters too, uh, just like the men, just to get prepared for you know actually playing quarters in the NBA. Um, so I think the fans appreciate that you know. So you're bringing in Darius Adams, you're potentially telling Baylor Mullins that you know join that to create that freshman backcourt that's going to be amazing to push guys like Ahmad Noel who are in the building. To push guys like Aiden Mahaney, who's a, a couple years ahead of you, uh, and will be back next season, um, and then also potentially bringing in a guy like Eric Reby, who could could be another part of this class to make it a, a three person class. Who's to say that they don't think this team in front of them? We talked about this a couple of days ago, or maybe last week, isn't as good as it was last year, where they're going to lose five, six, maybe seven guys. So you can't fill all that with portal. You have to fill that with players that you feel like are going to be here for the long long haul. And that's why a, a, a visit of Nate Ament is potentially on the, on the books. Uh, and I think that's also that Cooper Flag-esque person that they're trying to get because they want to not only be intentional with who they recruit, but Nate Ament, if you look him up, he is, he's got Dan Hurley written all over him. He is not a, he's not a talker, even though Dan Hurley is a talker. But as far, as far as the players go, he reminds me of he reminds me of Kevin Durant in body, but he reminds me of Tristan Newton in the way he his mentality is. Nothing bothers him. He's all about business, and I think Dan likes those players too. As much as he loves the Cam Spencers of the world, I think he really truly appreciates the Nate Immens, the Tristan Newtons of the world, who are they just like don't let anything bother him because he does he can't be like that. So I think that's another uh, kind of yin and yang that Dan really likes about his players that they're you know, ready to come in and shine, but they don't necessarily need to tell people about it. So I, I, I love that about Nate. Amen. I think he's a six foot 10 dynamo type of player that could play on the wing. Um, the, the amount of things that you could do with him in Dan Hurley's offense, Luke Murray's offense, it, it's, it's mind blowing. Um, Cause what's the big picture here, guys, Dan is building a dynasty. That is a legacy that I feel like he is knows is within reach. Because if this team is as good as he thinks it is, it is going to be in contention again to win a national championship. Can they win it every year? We're here to find out. Like, that's that's what this is about. So, again, Darius Adams signed. Just so you guys know, October 16th, Braylon Mullins will decide between 
UConn, Indiana, North Carolina. I will be on live with Locked On Hoosiers, and one of us will get to gloat, to get to gloat on who gets Braylon Mullins, who I think is the best shooter in this class. Um, and I know that the Huskies are salivating over his talent. Um, and then last, Eric Reeby, I think he's closer to end of October. Maybe the 23rd is something I heard, but, but don't hold me to that. So by the end of October, you're going to understand where this where this team is headed. And I'm, for one, looking forward to the October 16th show, and I'm also looking forward to the continued culture building and, and personal growth building that UConn is doing. And to use a quote from Dan Hurley, it all matters. It all matters, but only when you win. So we'll we'll talk about that and bring in Evan Rodriguez coming back from the break after this. All right, Husky fans, if you haven't heard about Roy, let's talk about it now. I'm going to give you my Roy player of the week. It's Jordan Wright, linebacker from the University of Connecticut Huskies, whose 96-yard fumble recovery sealed the deal on the Huskies' win over Temple at the Horn. Play was epic. It was on SportsCenter. Scott Van Pelt had it on his show. He does def definitely deserves some love. If you haven't heard about Roy yet, it's the app that lets you directly support your favorite athletes. Unlike the collectives that I support, like Bleeding Blue for Good, you donate to a general fund with Roy. You choose the specific athlete you want to back. In this case, Jordan Wright. You support your players and that you care about and get exclusive content in return. So very much like a personal video or updates after the season, kind of like a cameo. The best part, it's risk-free. If the athlete transfers or doesn't create the content, you get your money back. So I just chipped in 100 bucks to support Jordan on Roy. The previous two weeks, it's been Skylar Bell, who probably has $200 in his account, who I, who I hope is rehabbing and getting healthy during the bye week, as well as our QB1, Nick Evers. Get well, guys. But I'd love for you to join me in supporting the players. You can make a payment of as little as $10 when you – when, when enough of his, of this is is contributed, it's more than just the dollars. It's about showing our support for Jordan and others like Nick and Skylar. Our collective backing helps keep helps keep him connected to UConn. Plus, Roy is hosting an awesome giveaway. One lucky fan will win two tickets to any game of their choice in November. Here's how to enter: Download Roy on the app on the App Store or Google Play Play Store. Use code Locked On when signing up, and you're entered already on Roy. Just make a payment. For any athlete's campaign, and you're automatically entered as well. For official rules ahead to joinroy.com, download Roy today. There's no subscription, no recurring fees for as little as $10 off. $10, you can jump into NIL game and make an impact. Roy, support the players, change the game. Well, as promised, I mentioned earlier in the show that we were going to have Evan Rodriguez in content creator at Stores Central. And self-proclaimed, he has the best shoe game in the press box. We're going to probably have to ask him about that. But let's get right to it. Let's bring Evan in and unmute his mic. Evan, I have to ask you right off the bat, man, not about shoes, but we'll get to that in a second. We're a month away from the start of men's basketball season and women's basketball season. We're in the throes of a football resurgence. We have big-time recruits signed on both men's and women's side. Transfers are doing great things for the UConn football program. My first question is, how good is it to be a Husky right now? And how easy is your job right now to cover it? Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's been phenomenal. I think, like, even going back to, like, when I was starting to, you know, cover UConn as a student, like, as a sophomore after, you know, everything that happened with COVID, um, I mean, it's gotten a lot easier. Obviously, you know, when you win back-to-back -back championships on the men's side, it just it becomes so much easier to get, like, content and being able to film, like, reels or bigger videos. But... You know, it, you have no shortage of anything on both the men and women's side, which is obviously so great. And, you know, one of the reasons I'm still covering UConn to this day. So, I mean, you know, it's absolutely phenomenal, especially even for football, too, with, you know, having, you know, such a support. Um, obviously, you know, at the scare on Saturday, but, you know, right now, yeah. I mean, it's it's just it's been great. Yeah, it, uh, I've seen a lot of this and we'll get into the basketball stuff and the player development that we're going to talk about, but I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this with the football program. Um, a lot of people, myself included, who are probably a lot older than you um, realize that this, that this program, this, this team would have lost this game um, last year, a couple years ago to see that growth. Um, what does that tell you about the football development before we get into the basketball? Yeah. I mean, I think with, 
even going back to like when I started, you know, really looking more at UConn football back in around 2021, um, I there was really no hope and, you know, getting more back on. And even when uh, I heard Matt Brock was coming on uh, and, you know, hearing him talk about football and being such a great football mind and, you know, bringing in the uh, the 335 defensive scheme, you know, it's been really, really good as far as the development. I mean, I was able to see, you know, some of the guys back in the winter um, develop and like I was, you know, tweeting about I'm like, you know, you got to look out for guys like Cam Chadwick or even on the offensive side, you know, Mel Brown and Darrell Robinson. And even when, you know, those two, those last two, you know, didn't immediately catch on. I mean, you know, you're seeing it now where, you know, guys are really catching on and buying into, you know, what is going on with, you know, this UConn football program. And, you know, now there's a lot of hope going into, you know, these upcoming games. Um but yeah, it's it's been really a great sight to see. Yeah, no, I I, I totally agree. Um, all right, well let's 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 pivot a little bit. You know, if, if we could do about a four hour podcast about you know every facet of the UConn athletic program and how how amazing it is, but we tend to focus on the men's and women's basketball programs and the football programs on this show. So I brought you in to talk about the men today. We're going to get you in another time to talk about the women, um, and we're going to talk about player development a little bit here. Um, I was I went back and listened to some of Dan's uh, preseason media availability and some of the the comments he makes about you know this being a less transactional program than most uh, that the culture that he's building at UConn. Um, can you talk about how like because I want I want to get a give people a sense of the feeling around that internally at UConn whether you're walking around in the building whether you're just kind of covering them. What's what's the difference between just kind of his words talking to to um to to the rest of the the reporters, kind of talking about that culture that he's building, that pipeline he's trying to create to 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 have these long term relationships with recruits, transfer portal folks, not just having these ten month transactional relationships. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of it is you know making sure when you go to stores, you know, you're locking in to like work hard and you know be the best player you can be. Um, I always think about the the one quote that he said, I forgot before what game, but, you know, we're we're not like making sure that, you know, we can be just this immediately uh, this immediate like one and done, you know, pipeline right. to the NBA. You know, you want to go and, you know, be the best player you can be, whether that's, you know, you're a two year player, three year player. I mean, you're seeing it with guys like Jordan, Jordan Hawkins, Donovan Klingon, you know, guys who stay two years in stores and then are able to, you know, make the jump to the NBA, you know, as a lottery pick. Um, but I think it's having that trust, not only recruiting the players, but recruiting the families, you know, that they're going to put your players in the best position they can be, whether that's, um, you know, in, in two years or three years, but, you know, making sure that they have that trust and, you know, obviously just working super hard um, in practice day in and day out. Yeah, for sure. In, in the, I think the comment you're you're thinking about the quote is that we're not a mercenary program. Yeah, and and that's you know, I think that's a really, that's a that's a that's a Dan Hurley quote. Like that's mm. a, it is is a biting quote. It's 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 meant to take a dig at other programs who kind of take a, every one one and done. Uh, I won't mention uh, which programs he's probably talking about. We'll keep that open ended. I'm sure everyone knows exactly who I'm thinking about. Um, but you know, I think that's that that makes a lot of sense for me because he actually made a really funny joke about, I guess, I don't know who asked the question, but he said, he said that he takes pride in the fact that, you know, he's in, in the, in the focus on the growth of people. Uh, and he's like, it's what makes coaching special. And he said, I, he's like, are you talking to my therapist? He's like, cause that's, that's exactly, that's exactly what he wants. Um, but let's talk about specific players. You, you mentioned this pre-show, you know, talking about um, uh, Jaden Ross, a solo, solo ball, Jalen Stewart, um, the, basically just the sophomore class in general. I did a story uh, or, or a piece last or, or a podcast last summer saying that UConn had won the transfer portal just by keeping these four players. And I, I still believe that to this day. Um, what do you think they're going to expect out of, or what are, are they expecting out of these guys, you know, to, to make that sophomore jump? Yeah. I mean, I think there's various expectations with all three. I think with, like, obviously hearing, you know, everything out of camp with Solo and how he's gotten a better shot. Um, obviously, you know, I'm looking at him to um, level up as a defender. Um, 
and just be a better overall player. I think he's definitely one of my guys that I'm probably looking a bunch out of. Um, I think with Stewie, I think, you know, I was really high on him with the, with the, you know, what he showed last year. Um, obviously not only on the defensive end, but also, you know, having those catch and shoot opportunities um, from three and being able to make, you know, a buzz during the Big East tournament. But I think, you know, him, whether that's off the bench or as a starter, um, I, you know, I'm really high on him. And then Jaden's sort of an interesting one because, you know, we didn't get to see a ton out of him. But, you know, even with the quote that Dan said today about how he's playing like a top 20 draft pick, I mean, you know, Husky fans got to be like super excited to hear that, especially when, that today. He, yeah, he did say he said the um, the basketball coaches uh, dinner or breakfast today. Breakfast. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you got to be super excited when you hear stuff like that. Um, and I, I mean, um, honestly, you know, we haven't heard a ton of him. But, you know, with with his athleticism and being able to, you know, have the size to be a potentially really good defender off the bench. I mean, I'm really excited to hear, you know, or and see what, you know, what he does. Yeah, that's an interesting quote. Um, man, that's that's that kind of like that doesn't throw me for a loop. That's a that's a that's a game changer because it kind of but it also kind of will get into. Keys of the season, we'll talk about that later, because. I'm so curious about those first 11 non-conference games and how he does the rotation. So we'll get into that in a second. But um, yeah, I think I think the interesting thing is balancing player development with you have a guy like Liam McNe- McNeely, who's a, a, a top 15, top 10 prospect, who's a five star, just the same way that Steph Castle was. Right. So you have a guy that comes in with his pedigree. Um, I know Dan doesn't feel pressure to kind of like start a kid like that, because let's face it, he. He's the, he's the king of college basketball at this point. So pretty much whatever, when people are in his program, they either do what he says or they get out, right? So I don't think that that's the case. But what do you think the challenges are with, you know, balancing that you you want, he said it's in the, pre, in, the, in the preseason availability, that he's rooting for some guys to win starting spots, right? How How difficult do you think that is for him to then say, well, if they don't win it, like if Solo doesn't get the starting nod and he has he gives it to Aiden, or if uh, if Jalen Stewart doesn't win the starting nod and he gives it to Liam because he's just a better player or did did more in the summer, how hard do you think that is to balance for him? Um, I mean, it's pretty hard, obviously, with the amount of talent that you have and you know how deep you can make this rotation. It's definitely going to be tough, but at the same time, you can have that sort of sense of you know comfortability in terms of being like you know these guys earned that spot and that they didn't just you know step into it you know as he said um i forgot what youtube video he said but he was talking about like you know liam hasn't won anything here you know yeah. he's got to earn he's got to earn that spot um yep. and that goes with the sophomores too um that oh uh, that goes with guys like aiden as well you know being able to earn a, a starting spot um and obviously you know there's guys like alex who you know are going to you know be the starter there but there's a lot of, you know, places that people are fighting for. Um, And I mean, it's, you got to have sort of the, the comfort of knowing that, you know, guys are going to work hard to, you know, earn that spot. And it's, I mean, as he said before in that, in that same media availability, you know, there's a lot of like unknown with, you know, what the rotation is going to be, but um, I mean, you feel good as far as, you know, having, like, it's a good problem to have in terms of having this much talent. Um, all right, before we get to the next segment, the keys to the season, according to myself and Evan, uh, talk to me about your shoe game, man. What do you, wh- wh- what's, what's the, in the rotation for, for the press box? Yeah. I mean, I go with like a lot of different stuff. Um, during the first round of the tournament, I got some like blue and red Nike dunk lows, but I've been going like a lot of different stuff. Sometimes like I know during like my first few years, I was wearing a lot of Yeezy stuff, but Obviously, when I was re- representing like UConn football, I would have to go and uh, wear more Nike stuff. So I would wear a bunch of Jordans. Um, fun fact, my brother actually works at Nike, so I'm able to get a discount there with some stuff. Um, so I'm definitely targeting like some Fomeros and like... Uh, you can't... Evan, don't say that out loud because now when people hear this, they're going to go, hey man, let me get that discount. You just like, it's just like, yeah, absolutely. you don't think I'm going to come ask? I'm definitely going to come ask because... <laughs> I I was at, at once known as in my younger days, and I still have Jordans. I'm the old guy that wears Jordans at the game, 100. percent But yeah, I mean, like I, I'm a I'm a huge Jordan fan, so um, we're gonna we'll have to compare notes uh, in, in the future. Maybe we'll maybe we'll do us 
a separate pod uh, just about shoes. But we will return and talk about the keys to the season with Evan Rodriguez of Store Central coming back after this. All right, your friends at FanDuel. What are we doing here, FanDuel? We are giving away $200 in bonus bets with your first $5 bet. Yes, if you are a new customer to FanDuel, go to the FanDuel app. Go to FanDuel.com if you're on a desktop. Sign up. You, you don't even have to use a promo code. You get $200 in bonus bets with just one $5 bet. It's a hell of a deal. Go check it out and tell them I sent you from Locked On. All right, we're back on Locked On UConn with Evan Rodriguez of Stores Central. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, okay, I sent you some notes pre-show talking about – I wanted to talk about keys to the season because, you know, it's a, it's, it's a popular topic, but this UConn team is very different in the respect that it is – it lost a ton. But I did a show yesterday talking about how – Every season that they've won a title in the last, you know, obviously the back back to back, they have lost a ton coming from they've lost a ton of their scoring and they've expected these big jumps from their players and they've gotten them in both instances. So that's obviously going to be the case here, hopefully, if this team is going to compete for a national championship. But what I wanted to talk about was a little more specific. And I'm going to give you my three keys and I want you to let's let's talk about them. But also tell me if you have others as well. I think the three keys for me going into this season are the first one is um, Alex Caravan. He is one of the most unselfish players and likely going to go down as one of the best college basketball players of all time from a winning pers perspective, whether they win this year or not. But one of his biggest attributes is that he uh, is incredibly effective with a very low usage rate, right? I think it was something like seventh or eighth on the team last year and vice versa. And around, I think that was like that his freshman year and something like fourth last year. So this year they're expecting him to be used a heck of a lot more. So that me with that comes a lot more responsibility. Let's talk about that really quick. Like, where do you, where do you feel like they're going to use him more? Do you feel like it's going to be to initiate offense? Do you think it's going to be more to like screen the way he has? Uh, I'm curious just based off of, of your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're probably going to use him in a lot of different ways. I would say definitely a lot more, you know, on screen actions, just with how Dan runs the offense and being able to um, bring in a lot of different stuff. Um, they're obviously going to make sure that not only his, you know, his defensive stuff is, you know, up, you know, continuing to improve. Obviously, since his freshman year, it was um, it was worse than what the, you know, what it's been. And he's continued to like steadily improve up to where it's been now. Um, and obviously hoping to make sure um, that he's continuing to take a big leap. I forgot the exact number that Dan was talking about, but as far as, you know, what his shooting number should be, um, mm -hmm. obviously he's even gotten better as a shooter, um, you know, you know, going forth in his UConn career. Um, so there's that. Um, but, you know, using him in a lot of different ways is, is very important, and that's probably, you know, where I think he would be. Yeah, I, I, I think it'll... I think right now he is he's a 39% three point shooter. He's 88% from the free throw line and 48% from 50 from two from overall. Um, I think that needs to be pumped up to. I think I think my number is I was talking about. Um, he averaged 14, just under 14, and five rebounds. I think for me he needs to significantly improve. So that that's like a four or five point jump. Whether that's just from efficiency rate, or maybe his points stay the same because they're getting it other places, but his percentages go up, or he's actually because he's done this before. I, I look back to the Texas game uh, when they had a bunch of they had a few injuries, they had some people in foul trouble, and he basically took over at the end of that game where he was doing like fadeaways off of one leg. Like the dude has more talent than people give him credit for because he's just been on these really phenomenal teams and has been the great like trail player has been the guy who will do all the dirty work, right? Back screens and slips to the basket, like the dunk in the Purdue game. So I, I still think he does all of that, but he, he still, I think he's going to look for his shot a little bit more knowing Alex though, not that I know him personally, but knowing his game, I, I, I hope it doesn't affect how he plays. Like he, I don't want it to be counter counterintuitive to kind of look for your shot more but to kind of hunt and process the game that you now are the number one option. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is just making sure, you know, you don't have, like, those super long stretches of, you know, where, you know, your shot just isn't falling and then you lose confidence. But I think the sure. one thing that um, he probably learned a lot more about himself last year that's really going to help him this year is, you know, his mindset and making sure that, you know, you're confident um, uh -huh. and making sure, you know, even when the shot's not falling, just you know, to make sure that, you know, you're, you're still fighting and, you know, you're still doing stuff and, you know, other areas to help the team and, you know, making sure that, you know, you can be a team first player. Um, but I think with Alex, I think a lot of those issues should be a lot better this year um, with solving everything. So I'm, I'm feeling a lot more, I'm feeling a lot better about him now. Yeah, no, I, 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 I just, I actually don't even think we have to worry about him at all. Like, I think that one of the things that I love about Alex is that he actually just went through that draft process where he knows just like Tristan last year, they wanted him, they wanted him to work on his leadership, more his vocal leadership, the ability to kind of lead a team other than just being kind of like a secondary player. And we saw what that looked like last year, obviously most valuable, most outstanding player in the final four consensus, all American. Like he, he, he did exactly what he was told. Right. And Alex is the exact same type of player that if you give him a directive, he's going to do it. So in the draft process, whatever they have told him privately, this is what you need to do to be a first round pick. Alex is going to do that. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to kind of that higher usage rate and, and seeing how that affects his overall impact. Um, the second key for me is uh, non-conference play. And it has nothing to do with who we're playing because I think the buy games are going to be just as telling as the non-buy games, but it's going to be about we'll have somewhat of an answer of how all this talent is going to mesh and how Dan is going to work this rotation of a super deep team. What are you looking forward to in that respect? Is it the Maui tournament? Is it the away game at Texas? Is it home against Baylor? What are you looking for in the non-conference? Yeah, I mean, I think the the number one thing I'm looking forward to is just looking to see how guys play their role. I think, you know, it's not a problem on these Dan teams where, like, ego is going to get in the way of, you know, what, you know, people should be doing with, you know, on the court. But I think that as far as, you know, what, seeing what those first rotations are and how, you know, um, play styles are gelling together is probably the biggest thing. I think, you know... I'm interested to see, you know, even like going to like the first scrimmage as, you know, seeing what that rotation is going to be, you know, going forward and seeing how maybe certain guys go up in minutes or maybe some guys go down and, you know, seeing how everyone gels together is, is probably the biggest thing. Um, I think that also seeing how certain guys, you know, got better, like how better yeah. is solo ball going to really be um, or how how much better is a guy like Jalen Stewart going to be? Or, you know, how how is a guy like Terrace Reed going to operate in this system? You know, there's yep. a lot of different, yeah, there's a lot of questions with this um, this Husky team. But, I mean, we're going to get a bunch of those answered even just in the non-conference. So I'm really excited to see how that, you know, sort of shapes out. The other part of this, too, is before we get into, like, the meat of the season, the Big East, the Big East uh, schedule, um, and then the, the, the calendar turns to 2025, I think it gives Dan a really fun opportunity because he has a lot of the, a, a, like a million different roster combinations that he can do with this team. So that's, that's also why the non-conference is what I'm looking forward to the most, not because it's the start of the season, which is amazing, but because like, are we going to, are we going to see Liam at the two? Are we going to see Jalen at the two? Are we going to see, uh, are we going to see Alex at the five with a myriad of shooters and Haas at the one? Like, those are the things that I really want to see, like how Dan, you know, like I, I picture a beautiful mind with Russell Crowe, like him, like figuring out like different ways. I'm probably aging myself. You probably don't know what I'm talking about, but like the number like or the matrix, like all these little like configurations of how he's going to figure this all out. And just seeing that unfold in those first 11, 12 games is going to be really cool because then we'll know, are we dealing with a juggernaut here? Are we dealing with someone that can, you know, like, he said the other day that Samson is working similar to like Oso Iguodora. Like, whoa, that blew my mind. Like, we're, he's going to be able to do some of that stuff. Like, so that's what I'm looking forward to. This is a, this is a totally different team than last year that just won a national championship. So that's what that's the that's why that is one of my keys. Um, all right, last one. 
and I want your your thoughts right off the bat. The defense, you lose the most impactful player in college basketball and Donovan Klingon. I think it's probably the biggest concern that Husky fans have. Maybe quell people's concerns or amplify them. What do you think? Like, do you think it's going to be a concern? Not from the effort, but just the the skill of it. Like, you don't have a seven foot two, seven foot three guy patrolling the paint anymore. Like, what's you know how are they going to adjust? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's definitely a concern, um, and it's it's a good concern to have. But I think that with ha- bringing in Terrace Reed is pretty big. Obviously, you know, there's the concerns of, you know, how he played in, in certain parts at Michigan, but I don't think you can put as much into it just because of, you know, the problems that that organization had. But I think, you know, having both of them feed off each other and being able to, you know, um, attack an opponent or an assignment on the defensive end is is really probably what's going to be the biggest thing in terms of, you know, replacing a guy like Donovan Klingon, especially with how impactful he was last year. Um, like, that's not something you immediately um, have, you know, that's not something you immediately replace. It's it's not easy. Sure. Um, but, you know, being able to have, you know, a guy like Samson who was able to have his experience, you know, go up, have a having a starter last year um, at Michigan with Terrace, um, I think is really big. I think also, you know, having him, you know, learn, you know, the system and being able to, you know, the expectations. Um, I'm feeling a lot better. And especially hearing Dan's words um, during that media availability, I think that's also pretty big. Yeah. But what about um, this thought process of it? Like I've in, in I know we're running, running late, but uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on this too. The, the ability to have size at every other position that kind of could, potentially negate it from a defensive perspective like at any point if they want to because we talked just talked about lineup uh combinations they could go you know i've heard solo is even kind of on the ball sometimes now so if you if you had a if you had a, a lineup with solo ball liam mcneely jalen stort and alex uh caravan that's six four six eight six eight six eight and then six eleven terrace reed so it's it's not the big drop off i feel like people contend that it is um because I feel like there's going to be other areas where their defense picks up. I think the on-ball defense across the board and getting in passing lanes, deflections are going to go up. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think not only replacing Davin, but also replacing Steph is is pretty big. So I definitely 100%. see the concern. Yeah, I see the concern from the fan base and, you know, replacing both of those guys. But I think, you know, when you have seen it in the past about not only the sophomore leaps, but also bringing in the talent that you did, I'm... I'm feeling a lot more confident. I don't think there's as much, you know, concern now with seeing how certain guys will fit and having the size that you did, you know, you have now. Um, I know guys like Liam, there, there are concerns a little bit on the defensive end by having the size and being able to, you know, get the experience and adapt to, you know, the, you know, the expectations of college basketball. I think that it's not um, as big of a concern, but I think, you know, you know, you're going to, it goes back to sort of the non-conference of, you know, one of the questions you're going to ask yourself and hopefully answer like, you know, can he go and um, adjust to these expectations? But, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling good about that too, in general. Yeah. And I, and I actually had those same uh, doubts defensively when Cam Spencer came here that, you know, he was not going to be able to cover at the level that was needed for a Dan Hurley team. And I was quickly uh, told to, mind my business because that is not a, that's just wasn't, a, it just wasn't end up being a concern. I mean, there were games where was he overpowered against a more athletic player? Sure. But the good certainly outweighed the bad. So um, I think that that's what we're talking about with Liam McNeely. I think he is going to have that same type of impact, albeit on as a freshman versus a fifth year transfer. Um, Evan, really appreciate you jumping on. We're going to have to, like I said, we're going to have to dedicate some more time to, to your shoe game another day. Uh, but this has been another episode of Locked on UConn. I, I am so happy that we brought on our first Store Central content creator. If you aren't a Store Central member, Evan, do you want to tell people? I mean, I think everyone knows what the deal is, but feel free to kind of to pump it up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Store Central obviously started in March. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the UConn fan base obviously knows, but, you know, we donate 100% of our proceeds to NIL. Um, and obviously, you know, bringing in more of the UConn fan base and giving that insider access is huge. And that's something that, 
everyone really wants to hear whether that's from, you know, from a recruiting perspective or, you know, what some of the coaches are thinking or players are thinking. Um, and being able to, you know, have that exclusive access is huge. And, you know, we want to give people the opportunity to, you know, donate to UConn, even if it's small, because, you know, that stuff adds up. And then obviously with um, player revenue sharing coming in next year, I mean, it's even bigger to have something as big as Store Central. Um, so, you know, the more of, you know, the UConn fan base that can buy into something that we're doing right now is, it's huge. And um, I'm probably not doing enough to, you know, show how no, you are, is, but it, it really is. It's huge. Um, but, and obviously, you know, we have a lot of people that were, you know, adding and, and sponsorships, but, you know, it's important for the, the UConn fan base to really have something where they can, um, congregate with and, you know, talk UConn yeah. basketball, UConn football. Um, and yeah, just being able to have that is, it's huge. So definitely subscribe to store central. Yep. As you know, I, I, I donate 10% of my proceeds to, to bleeding blue for good, but I also am a store central, uh, subscriber. So, uh, I'm a fan first always, and I really appreciate you jumping on. Definitely guys. If you have, if you aren't a member at store central, uh, it's definitely worth your money. Get it before it's, it's, it's the content is, is so exclusive that it could be more money. You know what I mean? It could be more money a month. Well, let's, I mean, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's the case, but right now it's what nine 99 a month. You can pay for the whole year. So, um, yeah, just go check it out. This has been another episode of Locked On UConn. I'm your host, Mark Zanetto for Evan Rodriguez. We ask you to stay locked on, stay connected, make sure that toughness meter is always rising. And as always, go Huskies.